so I'm going to present some work that is uh, still work in progress today. So uh, if anyone has any constructive feedback, that'd be fantastic. Or unconstructive feedback, if you wish, I'm happy to take that as well. Um, so we're going to talk about some recent alternatives to the quality that have been proposed. Um, and uh, and we're going to talk about whether they, uh, whether they satisfy basic axioms of decision theory, um, what their properties are, and whether we should adopt them uh, in place of the quality. Okay, so some quick background. Um, so the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review, ISA, uh, recently published its value assessment framework, which supports ISA's economic evaluations of health technologies from a US payer perspective. And what's notable about this um, is that it reports not only cost per quality, um, but also cost per life year, and something called cost per equal value life year gained, which has the acronym EVLYG. Um, so these are all reported together, right? So all three measures are reported. And the, the uh, EVLYG is intended to address an important issue with the quali, right? So, so as, as many of you will know, uh, when we use qualies, if, uh, if you have a patient with very poor health-related quality of life, an additional year of life expectancy for that patient will be worth far fewer qualies than an additional year for someone with very good health-related quality of life. And there is a concern that this um, causes discrimination on the grounds of uh, baseline health-related quality of life. Um, so that's one reason to use the, uh, the equal value life year gain instead of the quali. But the problem is that the equal value life year gained raises an issue of its own, right? Um, if there's a treatment that not only extends life, but actually improves health-related quality of life, that won't be given any uh, additional value over a treatment that simply extends life uh, by the same amount. So coinciding uh, with this publication of ICE's uh, framework in January of this year, uh, Bazu and colleagues uh, published a paper in Value and Health uh, proposing an alternative to both the quality and the equal value uh, life year gained. And they've called this health years in total, or HYT. And they've claimed that this approach overcomes both of these issues uh, that I've just described and may provide a viable alternative to the quality uh, and the equal value life year gained. So this is the, uh, the ICE report. If any of you are, are interested, you can download this from, from ICE's website released at the end of January of this year. And this is the, the paper that was published in Value and Health by, by Bazu and colleagues um, earlier this year. So the uh, purpose of this presentation today is to compare all of these four approaches together. So the quality, the life year, the equal value life year gained, and the health year in total. And, and I know that for everyone on this call, the quality and the life year will be familiar. Um, it is important, though, that we consider those first. Um, because both the equal value life year gained and the health year in total build upon uh, the quality and the life year. Um, so we're going to start by considering how each measure is calculated. And then for each of these, we will consider whether it satisfies two basic axioms of decision theory. So transitivity and the independence axiom, sometimes called the uh, independence of irrelevant alternatives uh, axiom. And they're, they're not the only two basic axioms of decision theory, but they are two very important axiom. And then finally, we will consider to what extent each of these satisfies a set of properties that decision makers may find desirable. Uh, they, they may not find them desirable, and all of you may have your own opinions on whether these properties are desirable, um, but we'll consider to what extent each measure satisfies those. Okay, so I mentioned two basic axioms of decision theory, transitivity and independence. Let's have a quick review of what those are before we continue. So transitivity, uh, here's a, a quite a nice definition um, from vocabulary.com. Um, so in logic and mathematics, a relation between three elements such that if it holds between the first and second, and it also holds between the second and third, it must necessarily hold between the first and the third. And a simple example of uh, this would be uh, if one is smaller than two and two is smaller than three, then logically it must hold that one is smaller than three. That might seem obvious, um, but if transitivity doesn't hold, then this is not necessarily obvious, right? Um, imagine how difficult it would be to learn. To, I've got a three-year-old who's learning to count right now, and imagine if this didn't hold, it'd be an absolute nightmare. Um, here's another example. So if A is a subset of B and B is a subset of C, then A is a subset of C. And uh, an example from economics, so if X is preferred to Y and Y is preferred to Z, then it logically 
follows that X is preferred to Z, right? It follows if transitivity holds, right? If transitivity does not hold, we have a real problem. Okay, the second axiom is something called independence. Uh, and the best definition I found of this, there's lots of different definitions. Wikipedia actually has the nicest uh, definition. So if A is preferred to B out of a choice set of AB, introducing a third option X, expanding the choice set to ABX must not make B preferable to A, right? So we've got a choice between three mutually exclusive uh, comparators. Uh, bringing an extra one into the set should not change your, make you flip between the first two. And, and there's a, an analogy here uh, attributed to Sidney Morganbesser from Columbia University. I think it's quite a nice analogy. So um, a woman decides to order dessert. The waiter tells her that she has two options, apple pie or blueberry pie. The woman orders the apple pie. After a few minutes, the waiter returns and tells her that they also have cherry pie, to which the woman says, in that case, I'll have blueberry pie. Right. So this is an example of violating the independence axiom, right? These are mutually exclusive desserts. Um, she thought she was making a choice between A and B, and she preferred A, and then suddenly C becomes an option, and now she prefers B, right? That doesn't make any sense. So that's a violation of the independence uh, axiom. Okay, so what are these potentially desirable decision-making properties that I mentioned earlier? And this is just a, a quick list that I've, I've put together. This is not, uh, um, it's, it's not all of the possible properties we might, well, it's not exhaustive, um, but these are some properties that we might uh, wish to see, we may wish to see um, in an instrument. We may not wish to, we might consider them undesirable. Let's have a look at them. So um, the first is that the, the measure um, assigns some value to current life expectancy, any value whatsoever. The fact that you are alive is assigned some value. Um, alongside this, you may wish that the measure assigns equal value to your current life expectancy, regardless of your health-related quality of life. So uh, a person who has a life expectancy of two years with very poor quality of life, um, you may wish that an equal value is assigned to that life expectancy than another person with two years of much better quality life expectancy, right? You might actually consider that undesirable. You might think it's better to assign greater value to, to, to higher uh, life expectancy, but it's a potentially desirable property. Um, the next would be that there's some value assigned to an extension of life, right? Any value at all. And, and the complement to that is that there's equal value assigned to life expectancy, right? Uh, and sorry, life extension. So, so if there is a treatment that will extend your life by one year, that should get the same value as another treatment that extends life by one year, but with a different health-related quality of life. Right? Is that a desirable property? It's not for me to say, uh, but as a decision maker, you may consider that desirable. The third one is that there's any value at all assigned to increased health-related quality of life during the current life expectancy that patients have. Right. So if there's a treatment that doesn't extend your life, but it improves your health-related quality of life, then it may be considered desirable that your, your measure assigns some value to that. And then, of course, you, you may consider it desirable that there is equal value assigned to an increase in health-related quality of life during your current life expectancy, regardless of how big that increase is, regardless of the baseline that you start from. All right, so independent of health-related quality of life, you may consider that desirable. And then finally, um, you may think that a value should be assigned to increased health-related quality of life during an extension of life. Right, or you may think that equal value should be assigned um, to. Oh, I'd say, or you, you could also uh, you could also wish that equal value be assigned to increased health-related quality of life during that period of uh, of life extension. So, like I said, these are not exhaustive, and you may be looking at this thinking actually some of these um, some of these are, I, I don't consider desirable. I see a comment from Chris. You say that positive value. I, yeah, I think some people would consider these to be. Um, something that should be assigned positive value. But I, I, you, you might think these are undesirable properties, right? Um, so I'm not gonna, I, I, I'm gonna be agnostic, right? As to whether these are desirable or not, right? But my, my interest here is to consider to what extent each of these four measures satisfies these properties. And then a decision maker can look at that and, and make their own judgment as to which measure they would they would prefer to use. I'm gonna use a hypothetical example today. and. To consider transitivity, you need to have an example with at least three uh, comparators in it. So I'm going to keep. I'm going to use the most simple example possible. Um, so uh, an example with three uh, 
three comparators, three treatments, X, Y, and Z. Uh, X provides one year of life expectancy with a health-related quality of life of one, so perfect health. Uh, y provides two years of life expectancy, but with lower health-related quality, so 0.6. And Z provides four years of life expectancy with even lower quality, 0.2, right? So this is as simple an example as we can possibly have, right? Let's keep the numbers really, really simple for this. Okay, let's deal with the quality first. And I know we're all familiar with the quality, so we'll go over this fairly quickly. Uh, but the principles we're going to talk about over the next couple of minutes are important later um, when we talk about the, the equal value life year gained and the, the health year in total. So consider this example with the three treatments. Under the quality framework, the value that we place on each year is determined solely by the health-related quality of life. So X provides one year of life expectancy with health-related quality of life of one. So we multiply this together, one times one, that's one quality. Uh, for Y, we multiply the two years of life expectancy by the health-related quality of life of 0.6, that's 1.2 qualities. And for Z, that's four years of life expectancy but with a, quite a poor health-related quality of life of 0.2, that's 0.8 qualities. And if we want, we can put these all on one figure. Uh, we can overlay these. Um, and the area of each region represents the qualities for the, the corresponding treatment. But this sort of graph, although this, this is quite common to show the area under the curve when we're talking about qualities, and it works as, for life years as well, it gets very difficult when we're dealing with um, health years in total right? later in the presentation. So what I'm going to use is a, is a slightly different graph. So rather than area under the curve, uh, notice how we've got the qualities here, 1 for X, 1.2 for Y, 0.8 for Z. Just put them on a bar chart, right, and have qualities on the vertical axis, and we can compare the three treatments um, directly uh, on a bar chart. And this, this format, we don't normally think of qualities this way. We normally show them as area under the curve, but this is much more helpful later in the presentation when we're, when we're looking at the health years in total. So quick summary so far. Um, in calculating qualities, we account for both life expectancy and health-related quality of life. Another thing which I didn't mention and which we take for granted when we calculate qualities is that the qualities for any particular treatment are not dependent on life expectancy or health-related quality of life with any other treatment, right? So when we calculate the qualities for X, we don't think about what life expectancy or health-related quality of life is with Y or Z, right? We don't think about that. We take it for granted. That's actually a very important property. And not every measure satisfies that property. And it has implications when we consider transitivity and the independence axiom, right? So we take it for granted, but we, we do need to uh, keep, it in, it, it, keep it in mind. So let's look at transitivity then. Um, so the quality satisfies transitivity because of that property, right? When you calculate the qualities for X, it doesn't matter what the life expectancy, the quality, uh, the quality of life, or the, the qualities are for Y or Z, right? So if you do a pairwise comparison, of X and Y, and you find that Y has greater qualities than X, and you also find uh, that X has greater qualities than Z. Well, if Y is bigger than X and X is bigger than Z, then it logically follows that Y is bigger than Z, right? Because the quality respects transitivity. Okay, so transitivity is satisfied. And this, this would apply to any example, not just the example I've, I've shown here. Uh, what about independence? Well, the quality satisfies independence as well. If you do a pairwise comparison of X and Y, you see that Y has more qualities than X. Um, look carefully at X and Y when we introduce Z. Uh, they don't change, right? X and Y remain exactly the same when you introduce Z. So the ordering of X and Y remains the same when you introduce Z. So it satisfies independence. So it, it's not possible with the quality to have that example from the restaurant where you change your preference because uh, another option is introduced, that can't happen with qualities, right? The qualities for X and Y do not change when you introduce uh, Z. So independence is satisfied. And then finally, what about those potentially desirable properties, right? As I said, you might consider them to be undesirable. Let's have a look at the, uh, the scorecard for the quality. And you can see that all of the A's are satisfied and all the B's are not satisfied, right? So the quality does assign value to existing life expectancy and it assigns value to extensions in life. Uh, it assigns greater value to both existing life expectancy and extensions to life if there is greater health related quality of life, right? So that ticks all of the A's. Um, but for the B's, none of them are satisfied. There is, there is not equal value assigned to current life expectancy or a life extension regardless of health related quality of life, which some people consider to be desirable, right? So, so that's the scorecard for the quality. Okay, let's move on to life years now. 
So again, we have this hypothetical example, X, Y, Z, and life years are even simpler than qualities, as, as we all know, because you don't have to consider the health-related quality of life. Um, so the value placed on each year is one, regardless of health-related quality of life. So X provides one year of life expectancy, that's one life year. Y has uh, two years of life expectancy, that's two life years. Z has four life years, um, and we can put it on a, on a bar chart like before, where it's now life years on the vertical axis. Um, it couldn't be simpler, right? So um, unlike the quali, life years account only for life expectancy by definition, not health-related quality of life. But in common with the quali, they have this property that the life years for any given treatment, X, do not depend on life expectancy or health-related quality of life with any other treatments, Y and Z, right? And because of that, when we consider uh, transitivity, we find that life years satisfy transitivity, right? So if, if Y has greater life years than X uh, and Z has greater life years than Y, well, then it logically follows that Z has greater life years than X. It's as simple as that. And it happens in every example, not just this one, right? We can now consider independence, same thing. In a pairwise comparison, if Y has greater life years than X, introducing Z does not change the life years. If we look at X and Y, we bring in Z, they haven't changed. Right? And this would happen in any example with life years. So it satisfies independence. Let's now look at the, the scorecard for, on, on, in terms of these potentially desirable properties. And we find that life year is different from the quali. And I've highlighted in red where there's a difference from the quali. Um, so 1A is satisfied for both. Both of them assign value to current life expectancy. But the life year assigns equal value to current life expectancy regardless of health-related quality of life. So if you have very poor health-related quality of life for a given life expectancy, that is valued the same as if you have very good health-related quality of life. It also assigns equal value to an extension of life, regardless of a given length, regardless of the health-related uh, quality of life. Um, we look at 3A and 4A, we see that the life year does not assign any value to an increase in health-related quality of life, either during uh, the current life expectancy or during an extension. Right? So a treatment that not only prolongs your life, but also improves the quality of your life won't be assigned any additional value than a treatment that merely prolongs your agony for the same amount of time. Right, So that, that might be considered a, a, a real problem. Um, and 3B and 4B are both ticked. So the, the life here assigns equal value to an increase in health-related quality of life because it assigns zero value. Right, It doesn't matter how big the, uh, the increase is in, in health-related quality of life, they get assigned equal value, which is zero. Okay, let's move on to the third one now. And this is where things get a little bit more difficult. Um, so the equal value life year gained. And this, this framework uses qualities to value each year up to the life expectancy with whatever is current treatment. And then it uses life years to value each year beyond this time point. So, Back to our example of three treatments. Now, the value of a treatment in terms of equal value life year gains depends on what is current treatment. This is critical, right? So let's first assume that X is current treatment. Now, X gives you a life expectancy of one year, right? So everything to the left of that dashed line is going to be valued using qualities, and everything to the right is going to be valued using life years. So treatment X itself, by definition, has a life expectancy of a year. So that's going to be valued only in qualities, right? So it's one quali, and we just convert that straight into X equal value life year gained. So it's one equal value life year gained. What about Y? So the, the first year is going to be valued using qualities. So that's worth 0.6. But the second year is to the right of that dashed line. So it's valued using life years. So that's 1.0. And we add them together. So that's 1.6 equal value life year gain. And then finally, Z, that has a life expectancy of four years. So the first year is valued in qualities, and it has quite a low uh, health-related quality of life, so it's just 0.2 qualities. But the next three years are valued in full. They're valued at three. So in total, we have 3.2 equal value life year gained. Now, that's all assuming that X is current treatment. Um, oh, before we move on. We can put them on a bar chart. So you can see now um, why I have a preference for using a bar chart here, because you can stack the life years and the qualities on the same uh, bar chart. So you can see when, when X is current treatment, X is just qualities, but Y is, is 
life years plus qualities, right? We add them together. And I've put a superscript one on the qualities, if you can just see. It's a little bit blurry, that figure, uh, but you can see there's a superscript one. And that's because qualities are only being calculated over that first year, right? So it's not the full qualities for the treatment that we would consider if we were using the quality framework. It's only qualities for the first year. And the life years have a superscript two because that's only the life years from the second year onwards, right? It's not the full life years that we would consider if we were using life years alone. Um, okay. So all of that assumed that X was current treatment. Let's do this again, assuming that Y is current treatment. So Y gives you a life expectancy of two years. So we move that dashed line across to two years. Everything to the left, we'll use qualities. Everything to the right, we use life years. So X fits comfortably to the left. We just use qualities. Once again, it's worth 1.0 equal value of life year gained. Y now fits entirely to the left of that dashed line. So that is valued at 1.2 equal value life year gained. But Z still crosses both sides of that line. So the first two years are valued in qualities, that's 0.4, and the remaining two years are valued in life years, and that's 2.0. So we add them together and we have 2.4 equal value life year gained. And we can put them all on a on a figure. And, and if you recall previously with, with X as current treatment, we had one uh, equal value life year gained for X, we still do. Um, but we had more than 1.2 equal value life year gained for Y, right? That's fallen. And, and Z has also fallen, right? Uh, it, it was much higher uh, previously. I think it was 3.2 previously, and now it's fallen to, to 2.4, right? And then finally, just for the sake of completeness, if Z is current treatment, we put that dashed line all the way on the right. So everything falls to the left of that dashed line. So we consider X in terms of qualities. So it's one quality, so that's one equal value life year gained. Y is measured in qualities, that's 1.2. And Z is measured in qualities, and that's 0.8, right? So what we have is exactly the same numbers as if we just used the quality in the first place, right? So that's if, so if we use, if, if the treatment with the longest life expectancy is current treatment, then the equal value life year gained is equivalent to using the quality. Okay, so just to recap, when X is uh, current treatment, we have 1, 1.6, 3.2. Look what happens to Y and Z when we move to Y being current treatment, right? They both fall. And then when we move to Z being current treatment, it's only Z that falls, right? And in this example, it falls to below the other two, right? And we'll come back to that in a few moments. So a quick recap, unlike the quality and the life year, the equal value of life year gained for a particular treatment depends upon life expectancy with another treatment, specifically whatever is current treatment, right? Um, that has important implications in a few moments when we consider uh, those axioms of decision theory, right? So during life expectancy with current treatment, right, for the duration of that life expectancy, we, we use the quality. So we account for both life expectancy and health-related quality life. Beyond that, that uh, we only consider life expectancy, right? Um, so let's think about those axioms then, transitivity. So for any given current treatment, the equal value life year gain framework satisfies transitivity. Those first five words are really important, right? That's a really important qualifier. So for example, if X is current treatment, then we find that Y has greater equal value life year gain than X, right? Um, we also find that Z has greater equal value life year gain than Y. And so if Y is bigger than X and Z is bigger than Y, well, then it follows that Z is bigger than X. But remember, X remained current treatment throughout all of that. And that's a really critical assumption. Um, what if it was Y as current treatment? Again, transitivity still holds. Uh, we find that Y is bigger than X uh, and Z is bigger than Y. So Z is bigger than X, it respects transitivity, but only because that current treatment remained fixed. And then finally, if Z is current treatment, Y is bigger than X, but we have a, uh, we have a departure here. We find X is now bigger than Z, right? So if Y is bigger than X, X is bigger than Z, then Y must be bigger than Z, right? But transitivity still holds, right? Um, so transitivity satisfied for any given current treatment, provided treatment does not change, transitivity is satisfied. Um, what about the independence axiom? That's also satisfied providing treatment doesn't change, right? So if X is current treatment and we have a pairwise comparison of Y versus X, <coughs> excuse me, then introducing Z does not change uh, the equal value life year gains for X and Y, 
right? They didn't change at all. And because they don't change, the, the ordering cannot change, right? So it respects independence. Um, what if Y is current treatment? And we have a pairwise comparison of, of Z and, and Y. Look at the uh, look at the, the the Y and Z on that graph. We introduce X, it doesn't change Y and Z, right? So it doesn't change the ordering. Um, and again, if Z is current treatment and we have a pairwise comparison of X and Z, bringing in Y does not change the ordering of X and Z, right? So this, this respects, it satisfies the independence uh, axiom. Um, but I know what you're thinking. You think, well, what happens if you change current treatment, right? <laughs> so that's a really important qualifier. Um, what happens? Okay, well, let's consider X, Y, and Z being introduced sequentially, right? So suppose that X is introduced first, so it's current treatment, and then Y is introduced sometime later. And when Y is introduced, it's compared to X, and X is current treatment, and we find that Y has greater equal value of life year gain than X. So Y is then adopted by the healthcare system, right? Because it has greater equal value of life year gained, we're gonna adopt it as, as current treatment, right? So it replaces X as current treatment. Now, if you were to repeat the analysis of this moment, you'd find that the equal value of life year gained for Y is now fallen, right? Because it's now current treatment, but it's still greater than that for X, right? So it remains current treatment. Now, sometime later, Z is introduced and it's compared to both X and Y and Y is current treatment. And we find that Z has greater equal value life year gained than both X and Y, right? So Z is adopted by the healthcare system and it becomes current treatment upon adoption. The problem is that once Z is current treatment, if you were to repeat this analysis, you'd find that the equal value of life year gain for Z is now lower than it is for Y, right? So if you were to use equal value life year gained to inform current treatment and you were to abide strictly by it, and we'll come back to this in a few moments about whether you really would abide strictly by it. But if you were to, then you would switch back to Y, right? You'd reinstate Y as current treatment, but Having done that, the equal value of life you gained for Z would increase. Now Z is bigger than Y, so you're gonna switch back to Z, right? And this will go on and on and on. Um, so if current treatment is strictly determined by the equal value of life you gained, then you'll have this cycle continuing indefinitely, right? You have an infinite loop. So uh, how would you deal with this, right? You might think, well, in, in practice, we're not gonna have an infinite, like no one's gonna keep repeating this analysis indefinitely in practice, sure. So they need a strategy for either avoiding an infinite loop or breaking an infinite loop when it arises. Um, so first of all, you could, here's one potential option, you could say, um, we're not gonna have any repeated analysis, right? So the decision might maker might impose that treatments can only be compared against each other only once. Uh, so that would prevent an infinite loop from arising, right? That first time you compare Z and Y, you find that Z is bigger than Y in terms of equal value life against. Z is adopted, end of story, we never, we never do a, another analysis. Okay, so there's one problem with that, which is that um, in that analysis, you compare X, Y, and Z. Imagine sometime in future, another treatment is launched A. Are we going to compare that only against Z? Right? We should compare it against all relevant comparators, right? which, which would include X and Y. Uh, but in compare, comparing A to X, Y, and Z, you're now recomparing X, Y, and Z, right? So, so prohibiting repeated analysis is really problematic when you've got multiple strategies and new strategies are, are being introduced later and you want to compare them to all relevant comparators, right? But I think there's an even bigger problem with this actually, which is that the order in which treatments are introduced determines what is current treatment over the medium to long term. Right, so just for an example, suppose that Y is introduced before Z. Uh, so Y is current treatment at the time Z is introduced. So Z has greater equal value life year gain than Y and it replaces it as current treatment. And if you don't allow any further analyses, well, that will remain as current treatment in the medium to long term, at least until any new technologies are launched. But if it was the other way around and Z was launched first and Z was current treatment, well then Y is introduced and Y has greater equal value of life year gained and replaces Z. So Y is gonna be current treatment in the medium to long term. So it really matters the order in which technologies are, are, are launched into the, into the system, right? And that's really quite a curious property. And this doesn't arise with, with uh, life years or qualities, right? So, um, so that's something to bear in mind, right? I, I think that's a problem. Um, another way of dealing with it would be accepting that infinite loops will, uh, will arise, but you could impose a treatment ordering, right? So you could say as a decision maker, 
uh, I'm going to impose one or more orderings. For example, uh, Z is preferred to Y. Um, and that applies regardless of the equal value of life you gained estimates, right? So even when you get an infinite loop, you can break it by just saying, no, I'm imposing that Z is better than Y. That's what we're going to do. Um, and I think there's all sorts of potential problems with this. This is one of, I said this is work in progress. This is something I'm, I'm still working on. But, but a major problem is that the desired direction of this ordering, so is Z preferred to Y or is Y preferred to Z, that cannot be determined using the equal value of life you gained framework alone. Right? It doesn't tell you what to do, right? So, so you need some other framework in order to impose that ordering, right? Um, so that's a potential problem uh, with with doing this. So, so anyway, I'm going to um, leave that for now. I, I I can't find a way of resolving of getting out of the infinite loop in a way that doesn't introduce further problems of its own. So that's something that if anyone has any constructive feedback, I'd be interested to to hear. Um, let's go back to this scorecard on the potentially desirable properties. And, and we see that the equal value life year gained, uh, again, it's a mixed bag. And I've highlighted in red those where it agrees with either the quality or the life year, but not both. Right. So if we look at 1B, we see that the equal value life year gained agrees with the quality, has the same properties that it has. It, it satisfies the same as the quality, but not the not the life year, right? So, so equal value is not assigned to current life expectancy. And the reason being that to the left of that dashed line, we use the quality, right? Um, but if you look lower down, 2B, an equal value assigned to life extension, it's the same as the life year, but not the quality. And that's because for life extensions, we, we use the life year, right? Not the quality. Um, Okay, let's deal with the fourth one now. And this is the most complex of the lot. This is where um, I'm sure I'm going to lose some of you because this, this is difficult. And the way I'm presenting it is not the way it's presented uh, in the original paper, right, which I found incredibly uh, uh, complicated. Um, so health years in total. Um, why has this been introduced? Uh, it's useful to go back to this, um, to this uh, scoreboard here. Um, what the authors point out in the introduction is that the quality violates what I have called 2B, right? They didn't have this table in the paper. They didn't, it wasn't that systematic. Um, they just said that the quality does not assign an equal value to life extensions. This potentially discriminates against people with low baseline health-related quality of life. And that's a problem, right? They also pointed out what I have labeled as 4A, which is that the equal value of life year gained um, does not assign any value to improvements in health-related quality of life during periods of life extension, right? So a new treatment that not only prolongs life, but improves the quality of it, gets no extra value compared to something that just prolongs life, right? And, and they identify that as a problem, right? And the motivation behind this, this HYT framework is to overcome these. And the authors claim that they do overcome both of these issues. Uh, now, a, a potential spoiler, um, it is actually logically impossible to satisfy 2B and 4A at the same time. Um, so we'll come back to that later, but let's see how they did. So um, it's built on a really troubling uh, assumption as well, right? So the HYT framework is built on the notion that life years gained provide distinct utility to individuals from the health-related quality of life gains, and that these are, utilities are separable in nature, right? And this is a fundamental assumption in this paper. The whole framework is based on this. Right, so you get utility from life years, just living those years, and you get distinct utility from improvements in health-related quality of life, and these are separable in nature, right? And that's a critical assumption. So what does that mean in practice if they're separable? Well, what it means is that life expectancy must be valued independently of health-related quality of life. Okay, that's the first thing. Now that in itself is not a problem, um, we can use uh, life years. That's supposed to be a, a big tick, a big uh, check there, but it's not appeared. So that's okay, right? We can use life years. But it also requires that health-related quality of life must be valued independently of life expectancy, right? And this is a real problem, right? This is actually not possible. There's going to be a great big X there uh, where that little red box is, right? This is not possible. Um, because being alive is a precondition for having health-related quality of life. You, you don't have health-related quality of life if you're dead. And if you are alive, then you do have health-related quality of life. There's no avoiding it, right? It might be good, it might be bad, it might be negative, but you do have it, right? So you, you cannot separate these two things, 
right? Uh, but nevertheless, they they try to do it. So so let's think for the next moment. I'm going to come on to how they did it in a couple of minutes. But let's think conceptually how you would go about doing this, right? If you had to think about health-related quality of life um, independently of the life expectancy, right? So what it means is, and I see Eldon said the utility is separable. Well, so here's, here's, here's my issue with this, Eldon, right? So if you have to consider health-related quality of life separately from life expectancy, it means that when considering the qualities for X, you cannot take into account the length of life, the life expectancy with X, right? Um, it cannot, you cannot have a different length of life for X, Y, and Z, right? Um, so you have to calculate what the authors call modified qualities for all treatments over a common baseline life expectancy. So we have to establish some common baseline and then we have to calculate qualities for every treatment over that baseline, right? Um, so sure, the, the health-related quality of life itself is separable. You could consider a different one of them for each of X, Y, Z, but the life expectancy itself has to be constant for every treatment. So just to give an example, right? One option would be that we uh, consider health-related quality of life for all treatments over one year, all right? So the life expectancy with X. So we have a dashed line at one year. Um, so when we calculate the qualities for X, that's not a problem, right? It's 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 the actual qualities, there's, it's correct. Yeah, there's not a problem there for X. But when we calculate the qualities for Y, we can only consider health-related quality of life for one year, not two years, right? So rather than it being 1.2 qualities, we would only include the first year, so it's 0.6. Qualities. There are 0.6 qualities omitted from this. Um, and if we were to consider Z, then we would only consider 0.2 qualities. There'd be 0.6 qualities omitted from this, right? So if we set that baseline at the life expectancy for X, we end up omitting qualities for Y and for Z. Now, that's only one possible option. Another possible option is you use the life expectancy for Y, right? So now we have an issue, which is that with X, we only live for one year but we have to consider health-related quality of life over two years. So you have the actual qualities over that first year, but then you have to invent these post-death qualities for an extra year, right? This sounds ridiculous. Uh, I think it is ridiculous. Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but you have to, to invent an additional quality so that you can consider health-related quality of life for those full two years. Um, for treatment Y, you can calculate qualities correctly. For treatment Z, we still have to omit some of the qualities, right? Because we've cut the, the time off at two years rather than four years. And the final option, which is actually the option that the, the authors went with, um, is to use the life expectancy associated with whichever treatment offers the longest life expectancy. So in this example, Z, right? So you consider health-related quality of life for four years with every treatment, right? So with X, we have to consider health-related quality of life for four years, not just one, right? So we have these post-death qualities. We have one actual quality, and then we assume that health-related quality of life continues until four years, and we have these three uh, post-death qualities. Uh, the, the authors actually refer to this as counterfactual health-related quality of life, the, the counterfactual health-related quality of life that you would have if you stayed alive after you actually died, uh, until the point where you would have died with whatever treatment gives you the longest life expectancy. But you don't get the health-related quality of life of that treatment that gives you the longest life expectancy. You get the health-related quality of life of the treatment where you would have died earlier, right? Um, with Y, you would also get some uh, post-death qualities, right? Two post-death qualities. And for Z, well, everything's calculated correctly for Z, right? So none of these three options are desirable. None of them are, right? Um, it's impossible to consider health-related quality of life over a common life expectancy without either omitting qualities for those treatments that have longer life expectancy or and or inventing post-death qualities for those treatments with shorter life expectancy, right? There, there is no possible way of doing that. And it comes back to that flawed assumption that the utility is completely separable, right, between life expectancy and quality of life, so that you can consider the health-related quality of life, the qualities, you can calculate the qualities entirely independently of any consideration of length of life. So in calculating what the authors call modified qualities, 
uh, in the HYT framework, uh, they used the longest um, life expectancy of any treatment. So to quote the paper, over a time period corresponding to the maximum survival under any given alternative. Um, so this results in post-death qualities for all other treatments that have shorter life expectancy. If you had an example where there was another treatment that had different health-related quality of life, but the same life expectancy as the treatment with the longest life expectancy, you wouldn't have post-death qualities for that one. But in this example, both of our comparators, X and Y, have shorter life expectancy than Z, so we have to have post-death uh, qualities for both of them. And how do we calculate the HYT? We sum the life years and the regular qualities and the post-death qualities. Right, so they, they refer to modified qualities. That is the sum of the actual qualities and these post-death qualities. And you add that to the life years, right, to get the, the health years in total, right? So, so if any of you are confused at this point, I find this incredibly confusing, uh, this framework. Um, so here's how, here's how it looks in an example, right? So let's suppose we compare X, Y, and Z together. And that's important. We'll come back to that in a moment, right? They're all there. Uh, they're all being compared together. So the time period corresponding to the maximum survival under any given alternative is four years, right, with Z. So um, we have that dashed line there at four years. For X, the modified qualities are one actual quality, because we actually lived for one year with a perfect health-related quality of life, and then three post-death qualities, so a total of four. And then to calculate the HYT, we add these to the actual life years of one, right? So that results in an HYT of five, right? Now, just bear in mind that these modified qualities uh, are calculated using the, the date, uh, using a life expectancy of four years, but um, on, on the assumption that you would, well, a consideration of how long you would have lived if you had lived until whatever strategy, until the life expectancy with whatever strategy gives you the longest life expectancy. But for the actual life years, we just use the actual date of death, right? Actual one year, right? What about for Y? So we've got 1.2 actual qualities, we've got 1.2 post-death qualities. Um, so we sum them together, that's 2.4 modified qualities as they call them. And then to calculate the HYT, we add that to the actual life expectancy, which is two years. Add them together, we've got 4.4 as the HYT. And then finally for Z, uh, we would have 0.8 qualities over this four years. There aren't any post-death qualities. So we, we add this to the actual life expectancy in years, so four years, so we've got an HYT of 4.8, right? And if we put it on a, on a bar graph, you can see now why it's, it's, it's helpful to use a bar graph for this. Um, you can see that X has the highest HYT of five, and that comprises one year of life expectancy, one actual quality, and then the three post-death qualities that get you to the life expectancy with Z, which has the longest life expectancy. And Y has two life years. It has, I think, 1.2 qualities. Um, and then it has a further 1.2 post-death qualities to get it to the life expectancy with Z. And then Z offers only 0.8 qualities, but then you've got those four life years, right? So that's what's really driving the HYT uh, for Z, right? So, but in this example, X has the highest HYT. So to summarize this calculation, the HYT for each treatment depends upon the longest life expectancy for any of the treatment comparators, right? So again, it violates that assumption or that characteristic, that property that the, that the quality and the life year have, where calculating qualities and life years, it doesn't matter what life expectancy is or quality of life is with, with other treatments. It does matter here, right? Um, and the HYT is the sum of the life years, the qualities, and also these post-death qualities, right? If you were to assume patients with on treatments that live shorter than the maximum uh, were to continue um, post-death with the same H, the counterfactual health-related quality of life uh, is what they call it. Um, so post-death qualities are calculated until the time death would have occurred under the treatment comparator with the longest life expectancy. And, it, and it's that bit that causes the problem because if you change the comparators, then you might change what that longest uh, life expectancy is, right? And that then changes the post-death qualities for all of the other strategies, and it might change their ordering, right? So let's now consider um, these basic axioms of decision-making. So the HYT framework violates transitivity, right? And this is a major, major problem. This is a deal-breaker, I think, 
Um, just like just like when I said, you know, my three year olds are learning to count and you know, one, two, three, and you know, it's a deal breaker if 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 two is bigger than one and three is bigger than two, but one is bigger than three. Right? You you can't order things, right? Um, I think if a framework like this violates transitivity, that's a that's a deal breaker. Um, so if we look in in separate pairwise comparisons, Y has greater HYT than X, right? So so this is a comparison of X and Y only. Y has the longest life expectancy in this comparison, right? So we 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 only have uh, one post death quality for X, right? Because the longest life expectancy is only two years. If we then have a pairwise comparison between Y and Z, well, now the longest life expectancy is four years. So um, Y gets post-death qualities over two years, right? So, so notice how the, the HYT is now much higher for Y than it was when it was compared to, to X, right? So, so we can see that, that Y was bigger than X and Z is bigger than Y. So if transitivity was respected, then Z has to be bigger than X. Uh, but if you compare them directly, then that's not the case. Because when you compare them directly, the comparator with the longest life expectancy is now four years for Z rather than two years when X was compared to Y, right? So, so now X is valued much more highly than it was before, and it actually beats out Z, right? So we find that in separate pairwise comparisons, Y is better than X, Z is better than Y, but X is better than Z, right? And that violates uh, transitivity. Now you might think, well, hang on a minute, you know, you, why are you doing separate pairwise comparisons? Well, it also violates the independence axiom, right? So imagine you have two strategies, maybe X and Y are introduced first and you compare them together. Um, and you find that Y is preferred to X, right? In a pairwise comparison, you then introduce a new treatment Z and look very carefully at X and Y when I introduce Z, they switch, right? X is now preferred to Y, right? And it might be that all we're looking at here is the HYTs. We're not considering the cost. It might be that Z costs a fortune and there's no chance of it being cost effective, right? But suddenly, because we've introduced this new treatment, which doesn't have a chance of being cost effective, it doesn't have a chance of being adopted, we've suddenly changed our preference between X and Y, right? That's a serious problem. Okay, so it violates transitivity, it violates independence. Um, how about that scorecard, right? So if we go back to the motivation behind the HYT, the motivation was to overcome two specific issues, right? One is that the quality fails to satisfy 2B, uh, the other is that the equal value of life gain fails to satisfy uh, 4A. And, and as I said earlier, logically, you cannot satisfy both of them at the same time. <coughs> um, and what we find when we look at the HYT is exactly that, that the HYT fails to satisfy 2B, right? It satisfies 4A, but it fails to satisfy uh, 2B. So it doesn't assign equal value uh, to life extension, just like the quality doesn't. And, and the reason for that is if you think back to the bar chart, the quality was there all along, right? The quality was a was a was a factor, right, in, in determining the HYT for each treatment, right? So the discriminatory properties of the quality, if you want to call it that, are still present in the HYT. Maybe they're wash they're watered down a little bit, maybe, right? Because you're throwing in everything else, you're throwing in life years, you're throwing in post death qualities, but it's still got that problem, right? So it's, it still violates uh, this property. And as you can see, um, if I just highlight now all of the X's in the table, all four of these violate some of these properties that people might or might not consider uh, to be desirable. And in fact, logically, any measure, not just these four, but any measure would fail to satisfy at least two of these because uh, 1B and 3A, um, you can't satisfy both of them at the same time. 2B and 4A, you can't satisfy both of them at the same time. So you have to have at least two Xs on the board, right? And as I said, this isn't a comprehensive list either, right? These are just eight potentially desirable properties, right? So it is impossible to come up with a measure that would satisfy all of these. Um, and remember that HYT framework did not have a table like this. They just picked on two specific properties, um, just two specific properties. And it's not possible to come up with a framework that satisfies both of those two properties. I'm just, I just see Ken sent a long question. I'm, I'm almost at the end, Ken. So I'm just gonna answer your question in a couple of minutes. So, um, so in summary, uh, the quality and the life year both satisfy uh, transitivity and independence. Uh, the equal value life year gained combines consideration of the quality and the life year. Um, and qualities are considered up until a given time point. Life years are considered thereafter. And that time point is determined by whatever life expectancy is with current treatment, right? So provided current treatment doesn't change, 
that's fine, right? It respects transitivity, it respects independence. Um, the problem is if that current treatment changes, right? And in that case, uh, using the, if, if you were to use the equal value of life again strictly as your only means of determining what is current treatment, you'd end up in an infinite loop, right? Um, and I think this is a, a, a problem, right? This isn't just a, a theoretical kind of kind of issue, right? Like the whole point of doing an economic evaluation on a new health technology is because there is a potential that this technology will be adopted into the health system. And you hope that it might, if it's cost effective, effective, cost effective, that it might replace current treatment in the future, right? That's why we develop new health technologies, right? We hope that that we can replace current treatment um, as we go along. So so if the, if the equal value of life you gained is going to, change over time for existing treatments as new treatments are introduced into the system that's a real problem right and, and we, we need to think carefully about uh, uh, carefully about the implications of that um, the hyt framework uh, attempts to overcome two particular issues identified by the authors the, the authors um, uh, considered the failure to satisfy these two particular properties as, as problematic as i said before a decision maker might not consider either of them to be problematic, right? Um, th the problem is it's logically impossible to satisfy both of those properties simultaneously, right? It doesn't matter what framework you come up with, you cannot address those two specific uh, issues, right? Um, the HYT framework is founded upon what I think is a flawed assumption, right? That you can you can separate uh, health-related quality of life from life expectancy and consider them independently. And, and I think it's flawed because you can't, it's, it's a precondition to have health-related quality of life is a precondition that you're alive, right? If you're dead, you don't have health-related quality of life. And if you are alive, then you do have health-related quality of life. So, so I, I don't think it's satisfactory to, to invent, counter to, to use the author term, counterfactual health-related quality of life, right? The problem with counterfactual is that it's counter to the fact, right? That there isn't actually any health-related quality of life after the person is dead, right? There just isn't. So, and I think it's also problematic to use the shortest, um, life expectancy with any treatment because you don't have to invent any post-death qualities, but you would have to omit qualities for other treatments. I think that's problematic, right? Um, so I, I just think this is a flawed assumption. Um, so the way that they've 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 they frame this, you have to calculate this counterfactual uh, post-death health-related quality of life. And it applies until patients would otherwise have died under the treatment option with the longest life expectancy. And the HYT is the sum of life years qualities and these post-death qualities, right? It's not obvious to me why you would want to sum them either. And, and finally, this framework violates transitivity and, and the independence axioms, right? Which I think is a, is a, is a deal breaker. So what are the take home messages? Um, it's impossible to develop a measure that satisfies all of those properties. And that list of properties was not exhaustive, right? So, so as a decision maker, you really need to think about what properties you want to satisfy. Right, like, like you, you, it is impossible to come up with a measure that does not discriminate in some way. So, what would you like it to discriminate on? On what basis? Right, those are the questions that decision makers have to answer. My concern with the with the the state of the debate in in the states, right, is that is that it's the the quality is being criticised um, because it discriminates uh, against patient life extensions are given lower value for patients with a lower quality of life, and that's considered discriminatory. Okay, but then we have an alternative measure that solves that, but then that assigns no value to an improvement in quality of life for people who otherwise have poor quality of life, right? And, and you, you can't have it both ways, right? So we need to decide what properties do we actually want the measure to satisfy. It can't satisfy all possible desirable uh, properties. Um, and when proposing new measures, I think it's important for researchers to ensure that they satisfy these fundamental axioms of decision making. And, and also, if you're proposing a measure saying that it, it's in response to two particular properties that you think other measures are failing on, you need to check that, first of all, it's possible to actually address both of them simultaneously and that your proposed measure actually does do that. OK, so I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much. <coughs> OK, so I see um, Ken. Uh, has got a question. So doesn't transitivity also assume a heteros paribus condition, which uh, fails to hold in your example? I think Bru makes his point in his analysis, the appearance of relations of intransitivity. Okay. Um, Ken, do you want, I, I don't totally understand uh, your question. Ken, are you able to, have you got a microphone? Okay. 
I mean, in, in my um, when I'm when I'm comparing X versus Y, Y versus Z, X versus Z, um, I mean, everything else is equal, right? All we're changing are the comparators here. I just see Eldon popped in. I think it's it depends on how you think of that criticism of the quality. I think of it as having a lower value for treatments that don't improve health-related quality of life during the life extension. Right. Okay. Um, but the flip side of that is that there's a higher value for treatments that do improve health-related quality of life. The point is it does discriminate. That's that's the key thing that it discriminates on the point of um, on the point of health related quality of life, right? And if if you're concerned that um, that, that if if there's a treatment that extends life, that um, I mean, what does the concern? It boils down to there's a concern that people with low health related quality of life, um, people with certain disabilities who have a low health related quality of life, extending their life by one year is given less value than extending the life of someone with perfect health. That's that's what the in the political arena, that's what the criticism of the quality is, right? Um, the, the the problem is that it, any measure that does not do that, by definition, has to assign the same value to any extension of life, regardless of health-related quality of life. And if you're going to do that, it's impossible to reward uh, the manufacturer of a treatment that not only extends life, but improves quality for people who have poor quality to begin with. Um, I did miss a question from David, higher up. Uh, so... Uh, do you think the better solution would be to use multiple health related quality type metrics? So use the quality and then use the life year in a scenario analysis and then allow a decision maker to take into account whichever values they prefer. Um, you could do that. I, I think, honestly, I think the most important thing is that the decision maker just is clear about what their values are. And they're just clear about the grounds on which they're willing to discriminate. My concern about what you're proposing is that they would choose whichever measure results in the easiest decision in any given moment and it, it might violate equity principles when you consider across different decisions right um that would be my concern about that i think it's it's just just let's just face this debate head on right and just let's talk about these trade-offs that we're going to have to make right um so Samantha says, is the quality not considered discriminatory because the ICE will be higher in patient populations with a lower baseline utility, even when a new medicine increases both life expectancy and quality of life by the same amount in two populations? Um, well, if it increases quality of life by the same amount in absolute terms, right? So let's say someone with poor quality life, 0.2, it, it, brings it up to 0.4, someone with relatively good 0.8, it brings it up to one, right? So the same absolute increase um, and the same length of life improvement. I think the incremental quality would be the same, wouldn't it? Because because for those with lower baseline, the the uh, Eldon says yes, thanks Eldon. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, I, I don't think it would discriminate in that case. I don't think because I think the incremental, even though the qualities would be lower, it's lower for the comparator and the new intervention, so the incremental quality would be the same for the for the for the, for the group with poor baseline health related quality life compared to the group with high baseline. I think. Let, let me know if that doesn't make sense or you disagree. Uh, are there any other questions? Um, I can't see any other questions in the box. Or oh, Samantha's typing. So while Samantha's typing, so as I said, this is work in progress, right? So this is not the, the finished article. Um, so if anyone has any any feedback, if, if people think I've, I've got completely the wrong end of the stick uh, on something. Um, so Eldon, Eldon says, some of your arguments are that HYT is bad because it ignores qualies. But if you don't think qualies are correct, then it makes sense to have something different. Sure. OK, so so my concern is not that it ignores uh, the, the quality at all. Um, uh, if you don't think qualities are correct, it makes sense to have something different. Having something different is fine as well. So it's like the life year, right? For example, that satisfies those um, basic axioms of decision making, right? So, so when I showed that table of the potentially desirable properties, if you are a decision maker and you think those properties that the life year ticks off are desirable, and you right, then then sure you should be using the life year, right? That that is that is. Um, Chris just says it doesn't ignore qualities, it adds to them. So that, that's the other thing is that it, it, 
yeah, the, the, it's it's now a kind of a, a mess, right? It's kind of life years plus qualies plus these what I've called post death qualies. But the the language they use in the paper is that you have a counterfactual health related quality of life that's applied post death, right? Um, so so Jen says, as you said, a criticism of the qualies that it's inherently discriminatory against disabled people with a relatively lower quality rating for health states associated with disability, as you said, using equal value of gains more evenly measures any gain in, in length of life, regardless of the treatment's ability to improve patients' health related quality of life. But it doesn't deal with the issue of, of the quality. Would a better approach be to improve validation of health related quality of life tools and measurement approaches? Um, I think it's important to improve the validation anyway, right? I think I think that's worth doing anyway, but I think you um <coughs> You, you 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 still have this issue, don't you? I see Chris has just said it's not counterfactual cause life, it's counterfactual existence, right? Um, so just to go back to, to to Jen's comment. Like I think I think we have to improve the validation anyway, but don't we still have this inherent problem? Like 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 I said, there's a there's a logical contradiction. We cannot solve these two problems simultaneously. I I don't think improving the validation would solve I don't think that's what you're saying, that improving the validation would solve them. But um if we if we if we like what should we do if we can't solve if we can't resolve both problems we have to decide which one we're happy to live with right um so samantha says a group going from 0.4 to 0.6 and living two years get an extra 0.2 qualies well so just to be clear samantha if if the counterfactual is that they would continue at 0.4 right is is, is that right um well they're getting two extra year longers okay um but going from 0.7 to 0.9 and living to okay, okay, okay. So yeah, you're you're right in that case. Yeah. So it's not it's not merely an improvement in quality of life. It's an extension of life. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right that they'd get fewer qualies in that case. If if uh, if you would have died today and your utility is 0.4 and a treatment gives you an extra two years at 0.6, those extra two years are worth 1.2 qualies. If you would have died today at 0.7, but a treatment gives you an extra two years at 0.9, then that's an extra 1.8 qualities. Yeah, so it is more qualities. Now, one counter to that is it's an extra two years in both cases, but it's not the same two years. Like one person is getting an extra two years at 0.9, and the other person's getting an extra two years at point, uh, 0.6, right? So is two years for one person in a really good state of health considered more valuable than two years for another person in a poor state of health? Right. I mean, that they are. It, it, it's it's not like it's an identical two years for both patients. And if we do think they're identical, right, then then that's the property that we want. Right. That an extra two years is worth the same, uh, no matter what that quality of life is or what the baseline quality of life is. The problem then is that if um, that a treatment that gives those who were 0.4, it doesn't just bring them to 0.6, it brings them to one. It won't get any extra value. Right. So as Eldon says, the question is, do we prefer 0.9 or 0 0.6? Right, right. Um, so that's the thing. If, if, if you can extend the life of someone with good health for an extra two years, um, you are getting more qualities than extending the life of someone with poor health for two years, but it's, it's a different quality of life for those two years. That's literally discriminating against people who are more stable. Yeah, it is. It's, it's saying that you get more qualities if you have a worse quality of life. Yeah. So then, so the way to solve that, Samantha, is to use something like the equal value of life you gained, right? So that the extras, those extra two years are worth the same, right? They're worth, they're valued at one for each year, right? Um, the problem there, though, is that the quality of life of that life extension is irrelevant. So then imagine that there was a treatment for patients with, with a disability that prolonged their life but didn't actually address the disability and that the quality of life is still poor. And then there's another treatment that comes along for that same group that not only extends their life but restores their health. That wouldn't get any additional value over the treatment that, that merely prolongs their life. Right? So that's, that's the problem with, um, with adopting equal value of life you gained. And, and if you want to assign an additional value to an increase in health related quality of life during that period of life extension, you're going to end up discriminating in favor of patients who have better quality of life. So Alex, uh, Alex has chipped in. I think the fact it has required an hour long presentation 
Well, I mean, it took me an hour, Alex. I'm sure someone else could have done it quicker. Uh, to explain what the HYG is, is a reason why this method will struggle to fly in reality, uh, where, where committees are sometimes struggling while our current symbol frame. Yeah, I agree. I think it's overly complex. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, but yeah, I'm sure someone else could explain it quicker. <laughs> I mean, I'll be honest, when I first read the, 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 the HYT paper, I found it very complicated, right? It's, it's, it's not presented the way I just did. Um, there is a figure in it, but it's, it's an area under the curve figure. And so because they've separated the utility of life years and the utility of uh, and the health related quality of life, um, they've got two figures for the same thing. Um, I think it's much more intuitive to do the bar chart approach where you can actually see what the components are um, uh, of the HYT. Um, are there any other questions? We've gone a few minutes over, so if anyone needs to leave, then, then please do. Is it right that from your table, the HYT doesn't solve the problem Samantha is talking about? Uh, yes, I think that is right. I don't have the table in front of me, but I mean, the, the HYT still has the quality in there, right? Um, remember that the, the one of the motivations for the HYT is to resolve what the authors consider is a problem with the equal value of life you gained, which is that it assigns the same value to all life extensions. And the HYT is trying to solve that, right? Um, by including qualities, but then not qualities just for the length of life, but they, 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 they want to try and harmonize how long the qualities are calculated over, right? So that's why you get the post-death qualities as well. But they're still qualities and they still take into account uh, either health related quality of life or or counterfactual health-related quality of life post-death, right? So they still discriminate in the way that the qualities work. So as Samantha said, yeah, it doesn't solve it. That's right, yeah. Okay, any final uh, questions before we sign off? Okay, thanks, Elvin, thanks. Yeah, it was, it was good. So if anyone has any comments, please feel free to email me. Like I said, it's work in progress. Um, so uh, yeah, if there's anything that wasn't clear, let me know as well, uh, please. Okay. Okay. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to sign off. Thanks again. Mm -hmm.